John has 21 chapters. When we complete chapter 14, we will be two-thirds of the way through the textual material. And yet for a three-and-a-half-year chronicle of Christ's ministry, we find that the last third of it is given to a week or just a few days. So it's quite amazing. This last portion is covering a lot of a lot of territory about what's happening. We come now to chapter 14. The title of the sermon is The Orphan's Way Home. Jesus is ready to leave. He is ready to take his step upward to the cross, the upward pathway as he is lifted up into glory itself to return to the Father. But what will become of his disciples? as he returns to the Father. This is distressful. Chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm, go- where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know the way to where you're going. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Him. Oh, Father, we pray, may the richness that's in this text for your people be opened and received and gloried in, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in chapter 13, we discerned a picture of our worship liturgy. Here in chapter 13, Jesus is cleansing and communing with his people in the upper room through word and sacrament. We also learned that liturgy leads to life. The vertical and horizontal ought to express itself in the in er, the vertical ought to express itself in the horizontal. We ought, Jesus says, to wash each other's feet and to enjoy communion with each other. Fellowship with Christ, in other words, leads to fellowship with each other. Because together we gather around, together we gather in fellowship with him, which creates a bond of fellowship with each other. And so what Jesus does here with his disciples, using a basin and bread, is an anticipation. It's looking forward to what will be after he's left after he's returned to the Father. And they could not, as he said, you cannot follow me as I return to the Father presently. And yet he's leaving behind for them what? To continue in the basin and bread, though he is moving on. He would not be them anymore. They would not be able to to look to him, to eat with him, to touch him, to ask him his questions, to lay down at night knowing he's just on the other side of the campfire. And that was deeply troubling. Basin, bread, brotherhood, but no Jesus. And so in chapter 14 is Jesus' answer to what is missing in chapter 13. And so 13 and 14, they they go together. Even though these are discrete units, they go together. One is setting up for the other. 13 is about the cross. 14, about the Spirit. Two realities from the very beginning of John's Gospel. Remember way back there in chapter 1, and John the Baptist introduced him, the Lamb of God who would baptize in the Holy Spirit. These two features are prominent 
chapter 13 as lamb nailed to the cross, chapter 14 as giver of the Holy Spirit. Behold the Lamb of God who baptizes in the Spirit. Yes, Jesus was about to be offered as the Lamb, lifted up on his return trip to the Father. And Jesus says to them, what? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. There's the theme right there of chapter 14. That's what it's all about. So let's just kind of, you notice in your outline here, I just wanted to kind of give you a little uh, brief structure of chapter 14 because there is a definite structure to be detected here. Uh, verses 1 through 4, uh, the opening verses, and verses 27 through 31, the ending verses, those uh, two uh, sections uh, match up with about the same number of words. They're about the same size. But they also have, are, are, are coupled together by two themes. One, the exact same words. Let not your heart be troubled, verse 1. And then in verse 27, again, let not your heart uh, be troubled. And also, the other thing that binds together these two sections, 1 through 14 and 27 through 21, is Jesus assuring him he will come again. He's going to come again. And then in between these two sections, you have questions from Thomas, verses 5 through 7. Questions from Philip, verses 8 through 21. Question from Judas, not Iscariot, uh, verses uh, 22 through 26. And in these discrete section of these disciples asking Jesus questions, there's a certain theme that arises. 5 through 7, the disciples will come to the Father through the Son. Judas, the Father and Son, will come to the disciples. So you will come to the disciples, the Father will come to you. So you see this coming together. And then in Philip's, of course, larger section, the central section, we have uh, on display this union of Father and Son with the disciples. Of course, this is a union effectuated, how? But by the Holy Spirit. And so we have this, this point being made, this overall communication to relieve the troubled state of the disciples' hearts in the absence of Jesus in the flesh. This, this very comforting, rich, redemptive reality. And that's this, that the Spirit is Christ coming to bring about union with the Father and the Son. The disciples won't be left just to do a liturgy. They won't be left behind uh, just to wash each other's feet. The Holy Spirit is coming as a living dynamic, the very presence of Christ Himself, so they might have fellowship with the triune God. And the Spirit, of course, is that Spirit from heaven, where He is sent from, so that heaven will be there with them. Covenant union in communion will be enriched uh, with their liturgy uh, and their life together as they seek to commune one with another and wash each other's feet. So, verse 1 sets up, you might say, the narrative, the problem. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Now this troubling of hearts is the same word that Jesus uh, used with regard to himself in the prior chapter uh, regarding Judas uh, encroaching betrayal, that his heart was troubled at Judas' betrayal. Again, in Lazarus' death, his heart is troubled. So whether it's with the loss of Lazarus or the loss of Judas, the heart of Christ is troubled at the loss of these people. And now, what? It's the disciples' turn. 
their loss. They're losing Jesus. For three years they were with Him. For three years they were close to Him and knew Him and became dependent upon Him. But now there's this ripening of redemption. There's this fullness of the kingdom that is bearing in upon them and He is leaving. And this is distressing. Uh, Jesus has been in many ways so confusing uh, as he spoke uh, and acted uh, in riddles and in mysterious movements. Uh, what is it going to be like without him altogether? Uh, we won't have any orbit or any compass at all uh, with him being absent. Uh, and nobody can follow him. Stay here. I'm, I'm leaving. What do we do? Uh, just do the little, uh, do the liturgy, and you know, try to act like him the best we can. You know, just kind of what would Jesus do life now since he's not here? How's that supposed to work? And Jesus tells him, "Believe in God, you do. Well, believe in me, too, because belief in God is accomplished through believing." In me. Trust me. Trust me now. Listen to me now. Your hearts are troubled. Trust me now. Where to find comfort uh, for your hearts. You're faced with uncertainty. You're faced with fear. Trust in me, the Logos of God. And Jesus then gives them reason for that trust. He gives them as, as it is the substance of why their hearts should begin to be comforted in verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. My father's house. That's where he's going. And the father's house is in heaven. Our father, which art in heaven. Peter had asked just a few verses prior in the uh, end of chapter 13. Where are you going? Where are you going? Well, here it is. This is where he's going. He's going where there are many rooms. Uh, uh, he's going to the Father in His house in heaven. And it's a place where there is room for others to dwell there. Heaven's not an exclusive clubhouse. Uh, just where we stand at a distance and call out to God. But there's room for you there. There are many rooms to dwell with God. And so Christ precedes them as he tells them. He's going there to make preparations for their arrival. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you trust in him, you depend on him, then you have a home in heaven. Christ has gone to prepare that place for you. And Jesus said that God has prepared an eternal fire for the devil and his angels. And all the lost people of the world, those outside of Christ, Matthew chapter 25, will join the devil and his angels in that residency of the lake of fire. But those who believe, those who believe in Christ, will have their eternal home. Jesus assures them in heaven. And knowing that Christ has preceded us to heaven to one day escort you and me to your room, as he puts it, that's a great comfort for a troubled heart. But there's another comfort here that even exceeds, for the time being, this comfort, a close comfort now. 
uh, being escorted into the heavenly region someday is a distant reality, and we're, we're grateful for that eternal residency where we're headed. But what about now? What about the moment? And that's where verse 3 uh, carries us along. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now that's wonderful. That's comfort upon comfort. This is the answer to the troubled heart of uh, chapter uh, 13. I will come again and take you to myself. Where I am, you may be also. See, in many ways, as we read that, and, and, and some commentators struggle with, well, how do we interpret this? Uh, some say this, this is so resonating with the second coming that this must be a promise of the second coming of Christ. And certainly it's resonating with this reality. He's coming back from heaven. And there's definitely a, a, a uh, I guess you might say, a ring of eschatology here, a ring of the second coming. But in reality, what Jesus is talking about is, not an, is, again, not something far off, but something that is to occur shortly after his uh, going to heaven, that he's going to come back. Verse 15 through 18, which is going to be you know, looked at later, but it, 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 it explains to us exactly this is what's happening. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now listen to this. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is coming back from going to the Father by way of the Holy Spirit. He who is with them will dwell in them. The lever of intimacy will even exceed the presence of the fleshly Jesus in their midst. What comfort. He will come to what is otherwise orphaned people. You know him. He dwells with you. Christ, he will be in you, the Holy Spirit, and you will not be left as orphans. So that Jesus could say in verse 3, I go and prepare a place, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So comfort, comfort in the Holy Spirit is a return of Jesus presence to his people not the flesh and blood Jesus but Jesus by way of the spirit the Holy Spirit's presence so that the presence of Jesus can be known to his disciples not just in a little gathering in the Mideast but globally Jesus will dwell with Christians in Australia and in China And in Antarctica, if there's any Christians there, and in the United States, and Europe, this whole globe, because the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. He has come to them and dwells in them. Let not your heart be troubled. The Jesus who died for you lives, and he lives in you and goes with you, and will lead you to heaven. Be comforted. Be confident in your heart. Now, this is a great promise. This is a great promise that he not only speaks to his disciples 2,000 years ago, but this is a promise that is equally valid right now, today. And brothers and sisters, lay hold of that promise. It's for you. It's for your cognizance. It's for your awareness. It's for your strengthening as you go through this world, which is so precarious. 
Jesus doesn't promise to solve to your satisfaction all your problems. Jesus doesn't promise that all the pain in life will go away. You're going to have a few loose ends in your life. You're going to have a few knots that you're going to say, I don't know how to untie these. And that's life in a fallen world. But what God does promise right here by him who is the Logos from heaven made flesh is to you the gift of the Spirit to dwell in you and go with you in life. He will not leave you as an orphan. So therefore, do not think and do not act like an orphan. Don't live in some frantic survival mode of dread, of being abandoned and being thrown overboard. Let not your heart be troubled. You might lose everything in this world. I don't know. It's possible. As Martin Luther said in his great hymn, let goods and kindreds go. <laughs> right? You might lose them. They might be taken away. But you won't lose Jesus. You will not lose Jesus. This is his promise. Be confident. He'll be with you. He'll see you through it all. He'll usher you into the Father's house. Now Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas, is struggling with all this. <laughs> he says, Wait a minute. We don't know where and we don't know the way of what you're talking about. What is what is, what is it you mean? You know, this is just, where's, what's the texture to this, Lord, you know, Thomas is saying. And the answer is, there's a full hearth from home in Jesus. And that's the answer. Verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him because you've seen him. Now, it doesn't say it, but it implies it in me. <laughs> you see, Jesus' answer to Thomas is this, is, is this collective one and all. The, the where and the why, uh, the where and the way, it's all bound up. And what's the answer? The answer is Jesus himself. That's the answer. Jesus is the answer. <laughs> he is the way. You come to Jesus, you've already arrived. Jesus is saying here, the heaven to, to possess in the future that heaven, that Father's house to possess in the future, it's already here. It's already here, right now, in me. Believe in God. Believe in me. Because Jesus is the way to God. We see here another one of John's many I am sayings. And when Jesus says in John's Gospel, I am, in the Greek, ego, I, me, this is his identification with deity. Now he may add another noun to that. I am the bread. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Right? But we know when he says I am, he's referencing the fact of his identity as the God who spoke to Moses, the covenant God, the I am. Because in chapter 7, when he said before Abraham was, I am, uh, they immediately took up stones to throw at him. Because that could only mean one thing in their mind. He's like claiming identification with God. I am the way. God in the flesh 
I am the only mediator between God and man. I am the way to heaven. I am the way to the Father. And Jesus has done what needs to be done to secure that way to glory. He was lifted up upon the cross as Lamb of God, bearing the sin of the world upon himself, that he might be the way, that we might follow in his train through that cross into glory. For the cross opens up for us glory, heaven, access to the Father. He is that sin-bearer of His people. So confess your sins. Shake them off. Christ wants to be your loving preoccupation, not yourself. Whatever your sins may be, He's paid for them. That He might be your preoccupation. He might be your way. It's true, our, fans, our sins have no doubt offended God. There's no doubt about it. We deserve the elevator straight downward. But Christ is that Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world through His sacrifice so that we might lay hold of Him, our eyes may be lifted to Him, and being lifted to Him upon the cross may be lifted to heaven as our home through the cross. He is the way. The only way, the one way to come to the Father. No one comes to the Father, Jesus says, but through me. Now some people say, well, that, that makes your religion a bigoted religion. That makes your religion an exclusive religion. And all it is simply is, is it a claim not to bigotry or to exclusivity as much as it is simply a claim to truth. And truth takes care of itself. I am the way and the truth. Christ is the truth theologically because he fulfills all the Old Testament reality. Christ is the truth philosophically because he is the logos from heaven to explain the true meaning of life and the way back to the Father as he stood before Pilate and he so philosophically asked him, well, what is truth? Well, the answer is truth was standing before his eyes. Truth elusive, truth revelatory. Which will it be for you as it stands before your eyes? Elusive or revelatory? Truth shows up everything else for what it is. Lies, just as 2 plus 2 equal 4, shows up every other answer as false. Truth, a vital component in John's Gospel of light. Light has come in the world. Truth has come in the world. Shining in the darkness so that we could see things for what they are in truth. To see our sin. To see our Savior. To see the pathway that we are to take for sanctification. To see the difference between faith, hope, and love in Jesus versus all the fake offerings of an unbelieving, despairing, and desperate world of idolatry. Christ is truth. Truth theologically. Truth philosophically. The way and the truth and the life. As Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. When Jesus says, I am, I am life, that's what he means. He means eternal life, resurrection life, not life in this world. We know what life in this world is like. It's wonderful to be alive. But also we know what this life is going to end in. Death. Jesus is life, eternal life. And Jesus Christ is the only one. Appeal to any other religious leader in the world. Which one of them? Which one of them has broken the bonds of the closed system 
of death. Christ and only Christ. Christ is the way. Christ is the truth. Christ is life. And the beauty of it all, he's not far away and distant. Way out there somewhere. But by way of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is near. Jesus Christ is near when the gospel is proclaimed and the Spirit of God brings it home. We have dealings with Christ personally. And we must embrace Christ personally if we are to have him not just near but dwelling within us. And that is comfort. And that is confidence. And so John chapter 14 brothers and sisters, is seeking to answer a question. And the question is, do I have to negotiate this world all on my own as an orphan? Is it just up to me now? Do I just now go through the liturgy and now try and do what Jesus would do? Is that that what's left now? And the answer is, yes, do the liturgy. (laughs) Do what Jesus would do. He left you an example. But he goes with you. His life is in you. He will bring you to heaven. He will bring heaven to you. He will live in you. So let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe Trust in, depend, look to me. I will not leave you as orphans. Brothers and sisters, the Lamb of God will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Let not your hearts be troubled. Amen?